Okay, good morning. Um, this morning's lecture is titled Migration or Mobility, Threat or Opportunity. I've chosen this topic because it is probably one of the most salient topics at the moment in British politics. As you probably know, we're going to have an election, a general election in, in May, and migration has become one of the most important topics. I use the term mobility too because they often mean the same thing. And whether your choice of term often dictates your own position on the topic. So we're going to start off by looking at the political dimension. We will then look at other dimensions such as economic and so social. And I'm going to start off by just looking at why politicians currently, and particularly in the UK, just have problems with migration. And we look at other countries too, just by going through some pictures. Now for those of you who read the what's called the popular press, newspapers such as the Daily Express and Daily Mail, there are very frequent headlines which are often very alarmist in nature about migrants. And if you change the word migrant to alien or Martian, you can see how they have been depicted as a category of people who are almost diff not human in many ways. They're seen as taking jobs, they're responsible for crime, they're responsible for um, making this country overpopulated and we often use these metaphors uh, of related to the sea such as flooding, there's, there's a flood of migrants and uh, water based metaphors too. So looking at one of the most common fears that politicians have responded to and in some cases they have actually promoted is the fear of jobs being taken by migrants and a very, um, I, I, I'll give you an example of um, UKIP which is the United Kingdom Independence Party that has a picture of a British person who is unemployed because according to this party the migrants have come in and taken a job and this person is unemployed as a result of that. In the Netherlands, they have focused very much on an Islamic threat, and they're looking at particular mar migrants who come from places such as North Africa. And you can see that um, the threat there is that the country is being invaded by, by Muslims, not just migrants, but by a particular type of migrants. And interestingly, in Morocco, which is a Muslim nation, they, they see the problem as people coming from sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, the black peril. Um, and for Germans, it's the Turks. So Turk, they've got a large Turkish population in Germany. And you see that um, these migrants are flying in on a Turkish carpet into, in, into Germany. More recently, Greece, um, which as you all know is going through some very difficult economic problems and difficult negotiations with the European Union at the moment, the, a government minister has threatened the European Union that unless it starts to um, be more reasonable in its negotiations with the European Union that Greece will flood Europe with migrants and it says that and not just migrants but jihadist migrants um, which is so Greece is threatening to bring more terrorists into the into the into the European Union unless the European Union is more um, reasonable in its negotiations that's quite a major threat. Um, you can see in Italy, you've got the white person 
the white Italian person who has been put to the back of the queue, um, whereas the non-white immigrants are taking their, their houses, their work, health care, and, and so on and so forth. Um, in, in France, the far-right National Front Party, which currently gets about 30% of the vote, is th threatening French people, not threatening, it's, it's scaring French people by saying that if you don't vote, and you know, white French people, the immigrants will vote, and they will vote presumably for immigrants and for immigrants' interests. So that's the, the French National Party. And here's some images from the Swiss People's Party. Um, many of them bring us back to when we were children and we were reading ghost stories or watching films where you had um, wicked witches and, and, and so on and so forth. Another interesting dimension to the fear of immigration is that cultures such as the Italian culture, which like any culture um, is not static and changes. And one of the recent changes is in, in Italy um, there are now Chinese restaurants. You can buy foreign food and the Northern League Party sees that as a threat and they're saying yes to polenta, no to couscous. So couscous is being associated with immigration and it's being seen as a bad thing because it's, um, the Italian culture is under threat. They're mainly what you could say right-wing political statements but there are also left-wing political statements. Now, there aren't very many political parties who are openly for immigration because they are frightened of the electorate. But there are people who are involved in politics who are supportive of immigration and who support the rights of immigrants. And in Britain, I've given you an example of Owen Jones, who is a prominent political um, journalist and analyst of the left who, who, who supports uh, immigrants. Um, and, and then you see various slogans and, 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 po and posters um, in favour. So, as you can see, the debate is couched in terms of being for or against immigration. Generally speaking, businesses of all types support immigration. And they do that because immigrants are generally young. The, the, the age range, the vast majority of immigrants are under 35 years old. So they're young. Usually when they arrive, they don't come with dependents and therefore they, they, they work. And in a country with declining birth rates, immigrants fill, fill jobs and um, they're generally better educated and when you look at the work skills and qualifications that immigrants have compared to the native population they are generally better educated. <coughs> An interesting phenomenon too is they're more likely to become entrepreneurs, they're more likely to set up their own businesses Immigrants also do solve particular skills shortages, and we hear this quite regularly, that the fruit picking industry in the UK is largely dependent on immigrants. We also hear that um, the IT industry would not be able to function without immigrants. And um, nannies, people who have nannies looking after their, ch their, their, their children, rely on foreign nannies. Um, Another reason why business sees immigration as a positive thing is, is, is that um, the dependency ratio, which is the number of people who are working compared to the number of people who are retired, 
is temporarily reduced when you have more immigrants. Because they're young, we have more workers, the workers pay taxes, the taxes then support old people who, who, are, who are retired. And most studies reveal that immigration increases in economic growth because you have a higher population and with a higher population you have more consumption and you have more demand and therefore economic growth increases. Um, not by very large amounts, but usually by between 0.5 and 1% of GDP in, in the UK per year. But that is quite, that is quite significant. And immigrants also keep inflation down because as more workers come into the economy, there is less of a need to pay higher wages in, um, when, when, there's, when, when there's more supply of workers. I want to look now at the traditional theories of immigration, the conventional theories which we have all learned, and those who study economics may continue to learn some of these theories. And the first one is part of the neoclassical tradition of economic theories, which says that mobility of labor, capital and human resources is good because it leads to higher rates of economic growth. And the migration debate has always been couched in what are called pull and push factors. So migrants are pulled towards countries with higher wages and they're pushed from countries with lower wages. And it reaches what's called an equilibrium point where, where, where the wage levels in, in these senders country reach the equivalent amounts to the wage levels in the recipients country and then they eventually converge. And this is the economic theory that um, we, we, we were taught. And so the main determination of migration according to this theory is that people from low wage countries move to high wage countries for higher wages and that it eventually reaches an equilibrium point where both countries' wages systems converge. Now, I'm going to argue that th those theories are wrong. But first of all, I just want to show you one reason why migration is such a salient issue at the moment. The British population was surveyed about their attitudes towards immigration. And they're asked, do you think it should be increased a lot, increased a little, remain the same, reduced a little, reduced a lot, or do not know? And you can see that a very, very small majority of people would prefer more immigration. A very, very small minority of people would prefer immigration. And the vast, vast majority would prefer significant reductions of immigration. And these patterns are, are quite similar in lots of other countries. So, traditionally the debate has been, are you for or against immigration? Are immigrants good or are they bad? Most people think they are bad. But I'm going to argue that it's not possible to say that you are for or against immigration because immigration is a process and it's part of globalization, it's part of economic liberalism and the forces that drive immigration are related to different policy choices that we make and therefore if we pursue a certain set of economic policies which promote growth, in immigration is inevitable. Therefore, if you're against immigration, you should also be against economic growth. And if you're against economic growth, you effectively want to have lower living standards. If you're for immigration, on, on, on the other hand, um, well, 
Why are you for it? And we we're going to look at that too. <coughs> now, the official government policies, and I showed you pictures of how governments and, and political parties are very keen not to be in favour of immigration publicly. But privately, governments know they can do nothing about immigration. Privately, they know that immigration is a process that they cannot control. But they must pretend to be against immigration or they will lose the election. And they're frightened of the electorate. So, my main point that I'm going to argue throughout the rest of the, the, the lecture is that the traditional analysis of immigration is wrong. And I'm going to do that by looking at six conventional wisdoms or six myths about immigration. And, and then I'm going to ch challenge those myths. And in the second part, I'm going to look at the UK government policy and challenge that too. So, my first question and the first myth which we're going to explore is that this period that we live in at the moment is an unprecedented period of immigration. In other words, immigration has never been so high and has never been so out of control. And I want you to ask your partner in testing this myth two questions. Question number one is, what percentage of the world's population does not live in the country in which they were born. And I want you to look at 1960 and 2010, and I want two, two numbers. So it's the percentage of the global population in 1960 and 2010 that, or you could even do 2011 or 12 or 13. I'm not really that worried about what year it is. But in other words, now and about 50 years ago. So can you do that? Just ask your partner. Does, that, does, that, does that anyone have different figures? Yeah? So what, what would you give it to 1960? Okay. These are the figures here. Can you see that? Does that surprise you? Okay, so in 1960, it was 2.3%, and now it is 3.2%. So, in other words, 96, 97% of people live in the same country in which they were born. So on the basis of those figures, there is absolutely no evidence that we live in a period of unprecedented migration. And I brought this map, which you can't see very well with the colours, but in the, big pop, in the big countries with very, very large populations, 
such as India and, and, Ch and China, there are very, very few immigrants as a percentage of the total population. And you can see here, um, in this one, you can see that phenomenon more clearly. Now, the other point is in 1960, there were fewer countries in the world. And anybody who lived in the big Soviet bloc, that was one country. Nowadays, there are lots and lots of different countries there, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and so on. And people who moved from Azerbaijan to Russia are now migrants. In 1960, they weren't. So there's actual evidence to, to, to say that there isn't really that much extra migration since 1960. However, migration is concentrated and it's more prevalent in rich countries and in, and in countries that have been more open to migration, that have been more globalized. And so you look at the more globalized countries in the world, looking at the various indices, and you see that they have larger percentages. I mean, Europe as a whole, less than 10%, USA 13 point, and then so, so on and so forth. <clears throat> the next myth I'd like to challenge is that um, people who live in desperate poverty are more likely to migrate than people who live in richer countries. And think about some of the images I showed you earlier, particularly of the boat people, all those people huddled on one boat, coming from Africa over to Europe. And think of the traditional image of, of a migrant. And many people think of very, very poor, desperate people. In fact, it's the opposite. Sub-Saharan Africa, which is probably the poorest part of the world, has some of the lowest levels of migration. And there's a simple explanation as well as evidence, and that is when you're very, very poor, you cannot even afford basic clothes, a bus fare. You can't even afford to, you know, food. And the idea that you can therefore migrate to another part of the world and spend often hundreds or thousands of dollars in getting there is just nonsensical. What happens in practice is as countries get richer and they become middle income countries, migration <coughs> suddenly increases. And once the GDP per capita gets to about six, eight thousand dollars, migration starts to increase <coughs> even more. And countries have to become very rich for migration levels to start to go down. That's just a map of migration paths, which you can see are quite diverse. And there is a theory to this, which is migration transition theory. And what it says is that countries, as they're becoming richer, the population becomes more and more aware of opportunities and they start to get education and with that education they realize they can migrate they can use these skills elsewhere in the philippines they train as nurses for example and then migration suddenly increases rather than decreases So people who live in desperate poverty are not more likely to, to, to migrate. Now, this next argument is of particular appeal to left-wing people, people who are compassionate. Because lots of countries spe spend money on what's called development aid. So, you know, the European Union invests money in projects in Africa, even in America, they spend money on, de on development in poor countries. And the argument goes that if we, do, if we spend more money investing in countries where migrants come from, they will be more likely to stay. 
So it's seen as a kind of in, enlightened self-interest. We can control the migration problem by investing more. There is very little evidence that this, that, that this works. And in fact, there's more evidence to suggest that investing in countries increases migration because you invest in skills, you invest, give people jobs, enough money to save up to then migrate. And the, the real solutions would be institutional reform in those countries, not giving them dollops of extra cash. I was going to show you some videos, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, the, the time restrictions. What I want to say here too is the idea of remittances, which is when migrants go to a country, they work, and they send money back to their brothers and sisters in their home countries. That has often been seen as a solution as well. Remittances do help, but they don't control migration. Because, again, one person establishes themselves in a country, they start sending remittances home, and what do people do with the remittances? They save up for a ticket to go and join their siblings. And I'm not trying to argue here that problems such as the brain drain don't exist. Lots of poor countries lose their best people, and that's a, that, that, is, that is a tragedy. But what I am arguing is that <coughs> development aid doesn't work as a deterrent for migration. The next argument is that migrants steal jobs and welfare from the local population. So we hear this a lot, particularly in the popular press. It's a perception that lots of people have. And I'm just going to point to some studies on this because I don't think it's as clear as many of us think. The first studies are related to the fiscal benefits, in other words, the budgetary benefits. If, if there were more migrants, would the government have more taxes? And do migrants pay more taxes than they take in welfare? And in comparison with the British population, for example, who pays more taxes, migrants or British people? Who takes more from welfare, migrants or British people? And if migrants are net contributors, they actually contribute more in taxes. It's not significant, but compared to British people, they, the migrants are actually supporting British people who take welfare um, in, 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 in a small measure. The issue of housing is slightly different because there is a housing crisis in Britain, as in there aren't enough houses. And there are lots of reasons why more houses aren't being built, but it's true to say that as the population increases, regardless of how it increases, there is pressure on housing. And therefore, if we have an extra two or three million people in this country without building enough houses, you could say that there is a relationship between extra migrants and not enough houses. Whether it's a causal re relationship or not, that's, that's a debatable issue. As far as wages and employment are concerned, migration has been shown to increase wages at the top level, so for you know, the top, say, 40% of the workforce, the presence of additional migrants increases their wages because the migrants bring in new skills, the companies are able to invest, and therefore they are able to grow their businesses. And so in high productivity jobs, British people benefit from migration. The problem is Britain is a low productivity economy, and one of the 
one of the structural problems that has not been resolved is why, when we have economic growth, our productivity tends to decrease. And I think one of the problems here is that by having low minimum wages and lots of jobs which pay low wages, they actually attract migrants, often with high skills, to take these jobs. And so migrants are coming into the workplace and they are satisfying the labour needs at low wages. Therefore, what happens is the employers are not going to invest in productivity-enhancing initiatives such as technology. And so you have this cycle of a growth in lots of low-wage jobs, often taken up by migrants, so the employers are satisfied with that. As a result, at the bottom level, there is more and more competition amongst workers for low-skilled jobs. And because migrants are, are, are highly skilled, there is some evidence, very limited, but some evidence to say that they do keep wages down. There are, there are, there are, there are lots of different solutions to this, but it's, it's worth just pointing to that. Um, finally, as far as welfare is concerned, because migrants are generally younger, and most of them work, they are net contributors to welfare, and that's not really um, contestable. But we now need to look at migration as what's known as a circular phenomenon, because for every migrant in Britain, there are British migrants abroad. And so there are about 5 million British people who live all across the world, including in continental Europe. And recently, the Guardian newspaper did some very interesting research on un unemployment benefits. And what they found was that in different European countries, particularly, particularly the richer ones, there are more British people taking welfare there than there, are British, than there are people from those countries taking welfare here. And the reason why it interested me is because coming from Ireland, I noticed that there are 11,000 British people taking welfare in Ireland, and there are only 2,600 Irish people taking welfare here. And this, interestingly, is the opposite to the situation that prevailed in the 1960s and 1970s when there were far more Irish people who used to come to Britain to take welfare. And this illustrates in another way how migration is circular. It changes. People go out, people come back. So, for example, if you had a white Australian person called Jones who migrated to Britain, Maybe 200 years ago, their British ancestors had gone to Australia. And this is why I have to emphasize that migration is a circular process. And if you try to stop it, you have problems we'll look at later. Now, another interesting phenomenon is as a result of globalization and economic liberalism, the British government has privatized lots of industries, and they have stopped spending money on child support, they've stopped spending money on supporting old people, and therefore people who have children need to get private nannies. They need to get private, peop private arrangements to look after their grandparents. And where do these people come from? If, you, if you're an old man and you're 80 years old, who looks after you? Your children, not in this country. A British person, not in this country. They're all from Eastern Europe. And so, where you have a policy choice to privatize your support services, you then need to have migration to fill them in because the British population will move towards better paying jobs. And 
That's a contradiction in, in a sense. You cannot be both for economic liberalism and against migration. It doesn't work. The next point I want to look at is another problem that, another issue that's often seen as a left-wing issue, which is, well, migration will solve the aging population. Now, I've already said that businesses like the fact that the dependency ratio goes down, but this is a short-term phenomenon. Because if you look at the population projections for developed countries over the next, um, well, I suppose it will be the next 35 years, you will see that we are going to have a greater decrease in the workforce. People are living longer, they're not going to work, and we need more and more workers. We're not having enough children. Now, with migration, we would be able to slow down the problem, but we will not be able to resolve it. And, and the simple reason is there are not enough migrants in the world, and there will not be enough migrants. Because as China, as India, as the East grows and becomes more attractive, fewer and fewer people will want to come to Europe anyway. And I've, I've read recently that the European Union is most likely going to have to extend its borders beyond Europe into Africa in the next 20 or 30 years in order to cope with, in order to be able to attract additional migrants. When you look at the, what's called the um, dependency ratio, you can see that the problem where Japan is moving towards a situation where for one worker, they will have one retiree. Britain is not, too, not as bad at the moment. But using various statistical proje projections, we come to the realization that in order to maintain existing dependency ratios, France would need to have 1.8 million people every year between now and 2050. Britain, 1.2 million additional migrants every year, etc., etc. Now, at the moment, when Britain has 500,000 migrants, we have a national crisis. So the idea that it would have more than double that is quite challenging. Therefore, the likelihood is we will not be able to absorb those numbers of immigrants. Our, immigrate, uh, our, immig our stock of immigrants will remain broadly similar, and therefore, immigration will not solve the aging problem. And the final myth I want to look at is whether immigration can be controlled with restrictive policies. So in other words, you're a politician and you come along and say, Vote for me, and I will control immigration. And we do have politicians who say that. In fact, all our politicians say that. And we look at this map of Europe, and we see countries such as Norway and Switzerland, which are not part of the European Union. And by not part being part of the European Union, it means it, they do not automatically have to accept immigrants from the rest of the European Union. The problem is, both of them have higher levels of immigration per capita than the UK. And the reason they have higher levels of immigration per capita is because they are wealthy countries. And wealthy countries will always be attractive to immigrants. They haven't been able to control immigration even by having much more restrictive borders and policies. So, how is Britain going to be able to do it? If Britain does try to restrict immigration, as countries have tried to in the past, and as we're trying to at the moment, we create unexpected consequences. And the first thing that happens is it disrupts the circular flow of immigrants. And the circular flow is some people come here, they stay for a few years, and then they go back home again. When you
you have tough immigration policies, what happens is people who, are, who have immigrated get worried. They don't want to go home. Think of all the illegal immigrants in the United States who never go home because they know if I try to go home, I will never be admitted again. And so the immigrants move into permanent settlement. And this has happened over the last few years in the UK. I'll show you the statistics. As soon as the government got, became restrictive on immigration, the number of people leaving declined. And immigration, can, tough immigration policies and trying to control immigration creates industries such as smuggling. And the smuggling industry is an awful one. We see, we read all, every summer these ships off Lampedusa in Italy with collapsing and people drowning. We have people smuggling on the back of lorries. I was going to show you a, a video um, uh, uh, on that. <coughs> Another perverse consequence is when you start to control immigration, people who normally would have arrived, say, as an economic migrant, come through a different channel. So instead of coming into the country on a work scheme, they will, they will arrive as a student. And so this government has tried to reduce student visas. And what happens then? People arrive as tourists, and, and so on and so forth. It is very, very hard then to control immigration and people behave in unexpected and unpredictable ways and it increases criminality. And the other one of course is now or never immigration. If you know that the British government or any other government is about to control immigration and bring in tough policies, more people will immigrate, will emigrate than would have otherwise. So on the basis of that, I am now going to revise the, my position um, with some statements and look at each of those six myths. And on the basis of the evidence that I've shown you, I'm going to say that we don't live in a period of unprecedented immigration or migration. People who live in desperate poverty are less likely to migrate. Investment in source countries will usually increase migration. Migrants do not steal jobs and they're not a drain on the social welfare. Immigration will not solve the aging population and migration cannot be controlled with restrictive policies unless, and we're gonna just look at the final part of the lecture now, which is to examine what the British government has done. Just some background. In the last general election, our outgoing Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, spoke to a lady on the street. He had his microphone turned on. This lady said to him, there are too many migrants in this country. And he just smiled and got into his car. And when he was in his car, he said, oh, what a stupid, bigoted old woman. <laughs> that was recorded. Got to the newspapers and suddenly this lady became a national hero. And the debate about immigration started to multiply. The Conservative Party, in response, promised the British people in 2010 that they would reduce the levels of net migration to what they call sustainable levels, whatever that means. And they said that it's going to come down from hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands within the lifetime of this parliament. Now that was from 2010 to 2015. Parliament has nearly finished, so his promise was, was Prime Minister Cameron, it would come down to 10,000. Let's look at what happened. Um, where are we? Uh, actually, I'll come back to this first. We'll look at the figures in a second. Just to reiterate, there is strong opposition to immigration. Um, at the time, around nearly 70% of the population thought there were more problems than opportunities. And it's actually increased um, since. There's, there's more opposition to immigration in, in, in the UK than in various
various other reference countries too. Um, we'll look at the statistics. 2010, there were 252,000. 2014, 260,000. So the Prime Minister has failed in his policy. Not just that, under his period of office, immigration has increased, net immigration. So what do you do as a voter if you're against immigration? Do you vote for another politician who promises even tougher controls on immigration? Or do you come to the conclusion, which I have, and that is immigration cannot be controlled? Unless. <coughs> you take drastic measures. Um, I'll just go back to some of the arguments. We've actually looked at them, we've, we've looked at them already, but there has been, a, the, 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 there are some academic studies which also support why immigration um, should be should be decreased. And they're the ones that have often influenced the, the policy makers. So they've come up with what seem to be tough policies. A van going around saying, if you see an illegal immigrant, ring this number. Fear amongst the population, fear amongst immigrants has been spread. You've got the Home Secretary who says, I can and will crack down on immigration. And so they're trying to sound tough. <coughs> One of the problems that has not really been properly understood by the population is what exactly is an immigrant? So we can see that in the previous statistics, where are we? If you just say there are too many immigrants, if you ask people there are too many immigrants, a lot of people agree. If you say immigration is more of a problem than an opportunity, people agree. But then you say, you ask them a question. Do you think there are too many university students in the country, foreign university students? Now, anybody who is here for a year or more is classified as an immigrant. So for any of you who are going to study at master's or undergraduate level, on the anniversary of your arrival in the UK, you will be an immigrant. So you ask ordinary people, are there too many foreign university students? Only 30% think there are. So most people don't think there are. Are there too many college students, high school students? No. But for most people, the categories that they're most worried about are asylum seekers, extended family, and low-skilled workers. The problem with that is most of the immigrants in those statistics are actually university students or high-skilled people. And therefore, there's a lot of confusion in the public mind because if you're in favor of international students but against immigration, you're canceling one out with the other. You don't really have the, the right unit of analysis. And therefore, the, 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 the public is very confused. But let's move forward to the election. And we will, have prom we, will, we will have promises, and we have promises from all the political parties who claim to reduce, that they want to reduce immigration. And the question is, can they? And, I, and I'm arguing, no, unless the UK 
accepts permanent economic decline. One country that's managed to reduce immigration quite successfully is Zimbabwe. But Zimbabwe has very major economic problems. For Britain to reduce immigration, it would need to leave the European Union, which it may do, but it would also need to tear up the Human Rights Act and trade agreements which allow asylum seekers in. It would need to really, really toughen the police up, not just put a number in the van, but allow police to walk anywhere with machine guns to really frighten migrants to go home and other repressive powers, which I don't think the British population would accept. It would have to introduce measures such as making it impossible to marry foreigners. And it would also need to completely ignore everything that the business lobbies say. And any British government that is opposed to business will have difficulties getting elected because business will make sure that they're not elected. And I think the most significant change would be that the, the government would have to close Heathrow's Terminal 3, 4 and 5 and probably 2 as well. So yes, we can reduce immigration if we do this, but I don't think we will. So that's my lecture. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? Or no? Does anybody have any questions for Edward? If you want to ask about anything, clarify anything, or if you've got an opinion perhaps you'd like to give? They were Did anybody think that the UK classed them as an immigrant? Did you realise that you were classed as immigrants in the UK statistics? Did you know that? You didn't know that? After the Second World War, yeah. it reduced yeah, immigration. I'm the home, the well, initially, it, immigration increased after World War II, in the 1950s in particular, and it was only later on that they, bring, they brought in restrictions. So, in the post-war period, when the country was building, rebuilding, reconstructing, there was a major increase in immigrants from the old empire. And that stopped as restrictions came in. And as Britain joined the European Union, there were, there, there were restrictions on people not coming from Britain. And the economy wasn't really growing that well, so there wasn't a great interest in coming here. But then when the European Union expanded, and particularly in the previous decade, there's been a major increase in immigration, partly because the European Union has expanded, but also because the economy here has been quite successful, particularly at creating lots of either very high paid or very low paid jobs, which Britain is good at. It's the ones in the middle that it's not as good at. 
So lots of people come here for all kinds of reasons, often to learn English. You'll get people from France who are very skilled and who want to go and live in France, but they will come here for say two or three years to learn English, work in a cafe, just for that reason, not necessarily economic migrants. So you have lots of different forces that are shaping migration today. And they're not all to do with people wanting a better job. Yeah. In England now, like now with immigration, what will happen? And how is it? If the immigration staff that like the complete is increasing, what will happen? If you had uncontrolled immigration, if there were no if there were no border restrictions, what would happen here? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think there would be an, an initial surge, increase, but over time it would probably stabilize. But I think the policy couldn't just be restricted to Britain because of being part of the European Union. We're, 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 we're a much larger zone. But I think that over time, particularly as you look at the demographic trends and the eventual tailing off of the growth in the world population, the, 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 the numbers would, would eventually stabilize and not be that much higher than they are at the moment. But I think that um, there are lots of concerns here about overcrowding. And there is, I have some sympathy because when you look at the population density of the United Kingdom and compare it to most other countries in Europe, there are a lot of people here on this island and there is crowding and so on and so forth. So does the country want to have 100 million people? Uh, not, not necessarily, but if it did, it would have to plan its infrastructure much better. Look at Japan, it's a very small country with 125 million people. They have very good public services, very good trains. They have adapted well. I worry about Britain because the government does not invest enough in infrastructure. Look at the train service here and compare it to France, where they have all these very fast trains, where they have very good public services. Britain doesn't, so there's pressure. Look at the housing stock in Britain. We have all these very old houses. We don't have, we don't live in apartments. We don't have, you know, we all want to have little gardens. We, we want more space per person. So if the population increased, we would have to start thinking differently. But you can, you've, there's countries all over the world, Hong Kong and so on, which has very, very high population density. And people, they just live differently. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation, Edward. Uh, I have a question, please. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, study procedure here in the UK, uh, as you know, large number of people, the notion of students now, come in the UK to study. Uh, do you think uh, UK, the UK's universities uh, have changed their procedure uh, positively? to uh, enable uh, international students to complete their uh, study here during this time, uh, compared with uh, 10 years ago? The Are you talking about the visa procedures? Yes. Um, and visa and procedures inside these universities. Something changed to, to, to absorb these large numbers. Okay, um, it, and you mean the, the way in which it, the international students are treated, the way they feel yeah. welcome?
Well, there have been significant changes over the last 10 years. I mean, there, there has been a lot of growth for historic and international student numbers. But in recent years, that growth has plateaued and is now in, uh, in, in decline. And one of the unfortunate problems with the politicization of the immigration debate is that you, as international students, are counted in the immigration numbers. So David Cameron, who is doing lots of muscle flexing, trying to pretend that he's controlling immigration, he has realized that one way of doing that is reducing the number of international students and creating an environment in which um, it, only a certain type of you know, you have to take an IELTS test, you can only do it in certain countries, making it much more difficult. And, this is my and, part, and part of the reason for that is because prior to the changes, um, we, were, we had a very successful industry that was growing and the language schools were growing. But there was, you know, a perception that people were using the student category, the student channel. Remember when I said earlier that when you try to restrict immigration, people who previously would have come as a worker come as a student. So they were looking at that and saying, well, are these people all genuine bona fide students or are some of them people who really want to work? So they've made this much more difficult for, 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 for universities. We, you know, Lisa and Deborah will tell you, we've spent a lot of time trying to change our courses, trying to make our courses easier for students to get visas for. And it's the kind of work we just find extremely frustrating and, and, and hard because often from one year to the next, we will have to completely redesign a course, not for educational reasons, but because we want people to take the course on the right visa. And this is a very perverse consequence of controlled migration. Because we know that everyone in this room, you're all highly intelligent people, you've come here to study, you don't want to stay in the UK, you're going to go home with your skills, and that's the truth. But we have to put you through all these tests and hoops and hurdles and it just becomes much more difficult for, for everybody. But the government, again, because people are, so many people are anti-immigration, the government is trying to respond to that. And you know, the students are the victims. Okay, I think we're running out of time actually. It, so it, should, it, oh, there's one more question. Okay, this will be the last question in Simon. Like you said, uh, my dad steals the jobs. I don't think so. No, I didn't say that. I said that, I, yeah. Regarding the statement that uh, my dad steals the jobs and that thing. What I said, what I said it, was... It, it was like, uh, if you got skills and you got opportunity to work anywhere. Because every country gives opportunity to every people. They can work anywhere. Okay. What's the lecture again? But, <laughs> Just to reassure people, just so you don't think I said that. Because like uh, you said, um, England has no IT. Um, That's what I said. Oh, do not. <laughs> yeah. um, migrants do take some... Yeah, look. I know you didn't want to... I'll try and keep this as brief. There is an economic theory which is called the lump of labor fallacy. And a fallacy is something that's not true. And therefore, according to economics, the labor market is not static, but it grows with the population. And if you have more migrants, you'll have more jobs. And the lump of labor 
fallacy proves that. By, and particularly in a liberal, underegulated economy. So therefore, migrants may take a job, but they'll create more. And so for, for every migrant, the overall net effect is positive. Sorry if I didn't explain that properly, but that was my, what, what I was thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.